Hi everyone, it's Amy here from Mrs Amy123 and today I thought I'd talk to you about how I grade my students in HASS. So if you've ever purchased one of my HASS units, you'll know that I don't have any big assessment at the end of them, like one big major test that assesses all of the outcomes and gives you an A to E grade. There's a few reasons why I don't do that. Uh, the first reason is because schools are going to grade on different areas. Uh, my HASS units have been around for about three years now and HASS as a curriculum area is only just being phased in recently to the point where we have to report on it. So we were being asked to start familiarising with it, start teaching it, but we weren't actually reporting on it. So this meant that it was a bit tricky to know what you were actually having to report on and to give an assessment to report on what you needed to be reporting on. Also, different schools report on different strands. At my school this year, we are doing I think it's geography in term one with civics and citizenship. And then in term two, I think we're doing history with economics and business. Uh, some schools do a global outcome. So it's just the HASS as a learning area. And other schools look at the inquiry skills as opposed to the knowledge areas. So it's really, really hard to give you an assessment that's going to guarantee your reporting grade is going to be applicable. Uh, also, there are so many outcomes covered in my 10 week units. So in any given unit, there is three to six learning area knowledge outcomes. So we're talking about the history, geography, civics and citizenship and uh, economics and business outcomes. But then there's also all the inquiry skills that they cover as well. So it would just be a huge undertaking to try and cover all of those outcomes in one assessment. There's no other subject that covers that much content in such a short amount of time. If you think about how many maths outcomes there are and how much time we dedicate a week to teaching maths and then assessing it, it's just not comparable. So it's not, it's just too hard to try and assess every single outcome in one assessment. Then there's also the fact that I touched on a little bit before, which is that geography, history, civics and citizenship and economics and business are all to do with knowledge, where the inquiry skills are to do with skills that you can learn and display. And when it comes down to the knowledge outcomes, I don't think that the assessing pass should be about facts. I don't think we should be looking at how many facts students can recall as to which grade we're going to give them. I, I'm not going to do an assessment that's going to ask kids, well, what year did the first fleet uh, stop into Sydney Cove? Or who was the commander of that fleet? Or what was one of the number, names of the ships? I don't think that's what we should be grading them on. I think we should be grading them on their understanding of that knowledge. But again, all of this comes back to what is your school asking you to report on? So in my units, I like to have an assessment column, which is going to show you how exactly you can assess what the students are meant to have learnt in that lesson. You also have a focus column, which tells you exactly what the students need to learn from that lesson. So those two are explicitly linked. But then there are also three types of assessment that you can do. Going back to our uni days here, you might remember there's diagnostic assessment. Diagnostic assessment is all about their prior knowledge. What knowledge have they already got? Now that one's a bit hard in house because often the topics jump around and students might not have any background knowledge about the topic. Then there's formative assessment. That's the one that comes in the middle and it's usually assessment as learning. So you're using an assessment that is an activity in the task. Then you've got summative assessment, which comes at the end, and it's the assessment of the learning. Now, that can occur in two different ways, because you can have diagnostic, formative, and a summative assessment within one lesson, so at the beginning, middle, and end. But you can also have a diagnostic, summative, and formative of a unit. So a diagnostic may be the first lesson, and a summative at the end of the unit. When you look at my uh, units, you'll see that sometimes I list assessments in red. That's because they're the main ones and I feel like you can learn a lot from them and these are recommended ones to maybe inform your grading. But it's also those overarching ones of diagnostic, summative and formative. Then you've got the ones that are usually in black and those ones are the ones where they're specific to those lessons and they might not give you as much information as the ones in red. So then you get to pick exactly what you're going to assess. You can assess work samples, you can assess worksheets, you can assess charts or diagrams, you can do observations and take antidotal notes. There are so many different ways you can assess. 
but you need to choose the assessments that inform you the most on what you need to report on. So if you're reporting on the strand of history, then you need to make sure that it's an assessment that is covering those history outcomes. If you're doing one on inquiry skills, then you need to be picking an assessment that's to do with those inquiry skills. So here you can see this is at the end of one of my units and this summative assessment is the main assessment. It's going to give you a lot of information and detail, but it might not be the only one you want to take information from. So jumping back to our university days again to the principles of assessment. Assessment needs to be educative, fair, valid, comprehensive and explicit. We need to be giving multiple opportunities for students to show us their understanding. I just want to take a second to remind you to check your state's resources. Different states have developed their own resources for helping you to report on different curriculum areas. Over here in WA, SCARSA has released the judging standards, which show us for each outcome what an A, B, C, D and E student might look like. They've also released a few work samples for us to look, look at and some assessments that we can use in our own classes. So check out what your state has produced. Okay, it's time now that I let you in on a little trick for how you can grade work samples in HAPS. It involves keeping three words in your head. For a C grade, I want you to keep the word identifies in your head. So students are identifying things like knowledge, or they're recognising something, or stating a fact, or who, or what. A B grade is taking it a step further. They're describing those things. They're giving more detail. An A grade is explaining those things. They're giving specific details, and they might be telling us why or how. These three words are going to help you analyse each of your work samples. I've also written the word opinion for a D grade, but that will make more sense as I go through some work samples with you. So once you've worked out exactly what you're going to report on, you need to go through the individual assessments and work out which ones are going to give you the information that you need to report on. So for this unit here, it's the one I currently am teaching my Year 4 or 5 students. It's the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and Australian Colonies Composite Unit. So for Lesson 2, I thought I was going to use this assessment as one of my main ones. The students had to fill out a retrieval chart based on a presentation that they saw up on the board about different area adaptions of the Indigenous population. Unfortunately that day, something was wrong with my students, they were just not in it, and I was really having to prompt and scaffold them uh, quite a lot for the first few examples, and then some of them got the hang of it, and by the end, some of them were doing it by themselves. But that would not be a good work sample for me to take and grade, because it wasn't showing the usual standard of work, and it wouldn't have been a fair assessment. So instead, I decided to use the one from the next lesson, which is about totems. Students, again, would see a presentation all about totems, and then they would be asked to pick an animal that represents them and justify why they picked that animal. They then got to make a necklace uh, for a totem, and then they got to do a gallery walk to see everybody else's. So here you can see the actual worksheet that they did. They had to choose an animal that best represented them. They had to write down the qualities and features that the animal had that represented them. They got to design an artwork with their chosen animal in it. And then they had to write down why do Indigenous people have totems as a bit of a reflection of the information that they had seen on the interactive whiteboard. Here is an example of a C student doing this task. So all these examples will be of a turtle, just so you can really clearly see the difference between them. So when it asked the qualities and features, this student just said they love the land and nature. When they did why do Indigenous people have totems, they just said so when they died, they could come back as an animal. So they've just stated bare facts. They've just told me um, information about the turtle and they've just told me one piece of fact about Aboriginals having totems. So here is the B student. The B student said they live in the ocean and I love swimming. My family and I spent a lot of time at the beach. So they're connecting the qualities of the turtle with them. They're describing it a little bit more. And then down the bottom, why do Indigenous people have totems? To show people they represent that animal and care for it. So they've given me a little bit more of a description for that answer. Here's the A student. Turtles spend most of their time in the water, and in the water is where I feel most relaxed. They are slow moving and I prefer to work slowly. So they're really giving me some specific details in there, and they're giving me the why. They're explaining it. Why do Indigenous people have totems? To have an animal that they care for and that represent them and their family, it helps show others the types of people they are. 
Now that's a great summary of what a totem is. It shows me that they've taken the information that I've given them in the presentation, they've put it into their own words, and they've pulled out the key features for them. They've really explained that topic. Now here's the D grade. I like turtles. Why do they have totems? They like them. So they're just stating opinion. They're not actually giving me any information at all. And that's what makes this a D grade. So let's look at another work sample now as we start to get a better idea of these three words, identifies, describes, and explains. Here is a task that my year ones had to do a couple of years ago. This is a flip book. So each one flips up and you get to write information. So there's a flip up for weather and they write what the weather's like. There's a flip up for is, it, is my favorite because, and they get to write what fav why it's their favorite. And then they flip up for events and tell me events that happened in a season of their choice. So for these work samples, we're going to be doing the season of summer. So here's our C grade student. They listed one word that it's hot in summer. And it's their favorite because they get to go swimming. So they've just identified one word that describes the season and they've identified one thing that's their favorite. So this would be a very low C grade. So here's our example of a B grade. They said it is hot, very sunny and no rain. So they've actually described it a little bit more than just stating down some keywords. And then it's their favorite. I like it when it is hot because I can go swimming and swimming is fun. So they've described it a little bit more. They've connected the aspects of summer with something that they like about it. Here's my A grade. It is very hot because the sun is closer to our hemisphere. They've actually explained the why. Why is the weather like it that in summer? And then they said it's my favorite because I like it better when it is hot because I can swim and it cools me down. The weather is so nice that my family spends a lot of time outside and we have barbecues. So they're giving me some very specific details there and they're telling me the why behind it, why it's their favorite. They're not just stating or describing it, they're actually really explaining it. So now let's have a look at the D grade. With the D grade, I really needed to prompt this person. You know, they're the type of kid that just sits there. They couldn't write down the weather without a teacher being there saying, okay, so what does it feel like in summer? Oh, that's right, summer is hot. And then for my favorite, I like it. They're not giving me any information. They're just giving me their opinion. So there's no reason that you can't still use tests. Tests definitely have their place, but they shouldn't be the only assessment that you're using to give a student a grade. So more often than not, tests really easily fall into the category of an A is 85% to 100%, B is 70% to 85%, C is 50% to 70%, and D is less than 50%. Generally, that's where a test falls, but it really depends on how the test is written. Is the test giving opportunities for students to prove that they're a B or an A student? So going back to those words that we keep using, is it giving students the chance to describe things? Is it giving students the chance to explain things? And in this test, which is from my Australian Government Unit for Year 6, it is allowing that. So we've got questions in there that just ask students to regurgitate information. So list a responsibility of an elector. But then we've also got a chance for them to prove that they're an A or B grade. Name a key figure in the path to federation and the role that they play. So how they state that role is going to be a big de determination in whether they get an A, a B or a C. So that question's worth three marks. You could almost say if they get one point in that question that it's a C, uh, two points in that question would probably work out to be B, and three points in that question would probably work out to be an A because they're really explaining that role. So they're not just saying that, oh, maybe they were a prime minister. Maybe they're actually telling us what they did behind that and explaining that actual role. You can also take a rubric and turn that into a grade. For me, an A is getting mostly in that highly competent column. A B is getting some highly competence and maybe a couple of competence. A C is getting mostly competent, but they might have one or two in the emerging column or one or two in the highly competent. That's your high and your low C. Then you've got Ds who are mostly going to be in the emerging column, and then the Es will mostly be in the non-evident column. I really want you to learn to trust your gut because most times the first grade that you want to give them is usually the correct grade. So you can antagonize over it for months, you can go and see other teachers, but you'll end up circling back around to that grade that you first gave them. 
So please trust your gut, try not to antagonize over the grade too, too much. So now you know how to grade individual work samples, but how does that equate to their final grade? Well, I recommend that you have at least four separately graded work samples to work from. That comes from the fact of having multiple opportunities for the students to show you what they know. So you're getting a nice rounded picture and you're not just basing it off one time assessment that maybe happened on a really bad day for them where they're not showing you the usual standard of work that they would give you. I also really strongly encourage you to mark them separately and that's for a few different reasons. Number one is your stress level. You don't want to leave all the grading work till right before reports are due. You saw before that I had a year four or five class and that I was teaching them that composite unit. I took a work sample from week three. I graded it back in week three and I put it in my reporting file. I've since done another one in week seven and I'll be doing another one before the term is out. Having these separately graded ones means that a picture is forming in my mind of what kind of grade level these students are going to get. And it means next term when it comes to it, I've had weeks and weeks of this grade going around in my head for the student so that I know and I am confident in my decision of what the final grade is going to be when I give it to them. If you rush around at the last minute before reports are due trying to grade a student, you're not going to be as confident of the grade that you've given them because it's over a shorter amount of time. Not to mention you're going to be so much more stressed. So once you look at all of these reporting marks that you're then going to have in your records book, how do you actually pick that final grade? Well, firstly, the obvious one is go with the majority. So if they've got C, 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 B, C, you're going to give them a C. If they are on a borderline, so let's say you've got three C's and two B's, I usually err on the side of caution with semester one, just because you've got to be predicting what they're going to be displaying at the end of the year in semester one. So it's a little bit harder to, to be confident they're going to get that top grade. However, in semester two, when that really final grade is there, then I also look at how high of an effort are they showing and can they sustain that work for the next year's teacher? I'll also look at their previous grade. So in that case with the C, C, B, C, no, B, I think there's an extra B in there, uh, then I would have a look. Did they get a B last year? That would help inform my decision. Did they get a B in semester one? And I would also be looking at if they're really trying because if what, they're one of those kids who just lets it all go naturally and they just sit down and they're not really putting their all in, but they still manage to get high grades, I'd probably be giving them the C. However, if they're really trying hard, they're really into it, they're giving it their all, then I'd probably push them up to the B. So let's have a look at some actual samples here and how I grade them. So in your reporting book, if you have a C, C, B, C for different work samples, I just give that a C. If it's a B, C, B, B, C, that's the one where I err on the side of caution. In semester one, I give them a C. And semester two, I might push them up to a B, but again, it depends on all those other factors. Uh, for a C, C, A, C, well, that kid was really lucky that they got an A in that assignment, but I would average it out to be a C. Uh, with the next one, the A, 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 C, I'd probably still give them an A, but I'd really be looking at that last work sample and asking why. Why did they get so low? Was there something bad that was happening that day? Did it all get too hard for them? What happened there? If it was in semester one and that was a really big major assessment and the other ones were smaller, I might be looking at giving that student a B, but again, it depends on some factors and their background. Uh, for the last one, the D, D, C, 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 I'd probably give that one a C. And the reason for that is because if the D, D is in my record books first, then that's probably back in term one. And maybe they were able to pull up, you know, maybe you got that relationship going with them and they were eager to please you and they pulled it up. Or maybe something clicked all of a sudden and they just got a better work ethic. Something happened there, but their last three grades were a C. So I would be tempted to give them a C. But again, it depends on why did they get those Ds. Okay, so you've sat here and listened to me for almost half an hour now. So what's next for you? I really want you to go and get a set of work samples for house as soon as you can and sit down and grade them. What I want you to do without overthinking it and as quickly as possible, put them into piles of A, B, C, D and E. So look through the work sample. Are they identifying it? Are they describing? Are they explaining? Or are they doing none of those things? Set the piles up. If you have any that are on the border, so you're thinking, oh, maybe they're a B or maybe they're a C, give them the lower grade just for now. Then go through each pile and compare them to each other. So go through all the A's, compare them to each other. 
go through all the beats, compare them to each other. It doesn't matter whether you start from the A end or the E end, but I do recommend that you go in order. What you might find is that the border ones from the four will stand out. And if they stand out, then that's when you can move them up. So if that one that you were erring between a B and a C and you put in the C pile, and when you see it with all the other Cs as you go, no, that's a B, it's going to reinforce your judgment and your confidence in that decision to give that student a B. Uh, then I want you to go to your records book and write down the grades and then shut your book and don't look at that work sample again. I then want you to do another work sample in another few weeks and see how the grades compare. And you'll probably find that most of the time they're achieving the same grades. An interesting activity also to do is to not look at the names of the students when you're grading them. Sometimes subconsciously this can impact us on where we grade a student. I also, and I know this one's hard, but I want you to try not to look at their handwriting, their grammar or their spelling when you go through these work samples. Handwriting, grammar and spelling are part of English. They shouldn't be assessed in HASS. We should just be looking at their knowledge and understanding for HASS. The last thing I want you to do is close to reporting time, I want you to sit down with a bunch of other teachers and I want you to show them some of your A's and some of your B samples and some of your C's and some of your D samples and work through the samples with those teachers and see if they agree. This is going to give you confidence in your own ability. It's going to make sure that your whole school or, or your district is grading the same. All of the resources that you saw in today's presentation all come from my various units on HASS. I've got three to four units for every single year level from foundation to year six, covering every single outcome. I also recently released my new composite HASS bundles, which are for my split teaching friends who need to try and fit every outcome for both of their year levels in an entire year. So these bundles are gonna make it so much easier for you. They each have four units, each of them covering 10 weeks. So thank you so much for your time. I really hope you're feeling more confident about grading HASS this year. Feel free to comment below with any questions you have or send me an email at admin at mrsamy123.com. See you next time.